morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Luke chapter 1, beginning on verse 11. Luke chapter 1, beginning on verse 11. Reads, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you in this time to open your word, for it is what you have desired for your people to do, is to open your word, to read it and to apply it to our life. There's really nothing more important that we could do than to open your word. So we are honored, one, that we have your word, and two, that the Holy Spirit that literally lives within us, who is the author of this text, will help us to understand the text and then to be able to apply it to our life. As always, we need your help, Father, as we venture into Holy Scripture, that we would discern it wisely that we'd be able to pull off the pages what is applicable for us today. You know the season that we're in. You know what we're going through. And you've written us this love letter designed for us and for our benefit, that we would know who you are and how we are to live out our life. We ask now, Father, as we read these words, that you would be with us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, you can agree by saying, Amen and Amen. Well, I welcome you to another time in the Word together. We are beginning a Christmas series. We began this last week. And the Christmas series is really on the, the first Christmas. What was involved with the first Christmas? But we've changed the name from being the first Christmas to the reality of the first Christmas. Because... Sometimes we can get it in our mind that it is incredibly quintessential. The birth of the Savior of the world, born in a humble manger, it becomes more picturesque than reality. Because of the season that we're in and the reality of the situation that we find ourselves in, I believe that the Lord's laid it on my heart to show you through the birth of Christ what the reality of the first Christmas was actually like. How did it come to be that the Son of God would be born in the city of Bethlehem? What actually had to transpire, and how did it come to be that Jesus, the Son of God, was born to Mary and to Joseph, born as the Son of God, the Savior of the world? How did it actually take place because if we can learn that God orchestrated all the happenings for the birth of his son and how the reality, well, it's difficult how instead of being born in a palace, he was born in a barn. Instead of being born to a, a rich royal family, he was born exactly where he was supposed to be to the exact parents he was supposed to be born to and how God got those two people, Mary and Joseph, from where they were to the town of Bethlehem. And what transpired before all of that took place? Well, what, when was it told to us 
that God would send the Savior of the world. How long did they have to wait for the Savior of the world, for the Messiah? Because if we can grapple with the reality that the first Christmas was difficult and they had to really trust God, then we will learn to trust God during this Christmas season. When things aren't the way we might want them to be and things are trying and difficult, we're going to learn if God was in the first Christmas, he's surely in this one as well. He's watching over us today like he was watching over all of the happenings in the very first Christmas 2,000 years ago. That's why we're looking at the reality of the first Christmas. And we began last week by talking about prophecy. Prophecy is when God speaks to men, to people, and he uses a prophet, a certain designated person that is, has the gift and the, the calling to hear the voice of God and then declare it to all the people. So we started with prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It was Isaiah the prophet that received these words. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What we learned, though, is that it was 800 years later, before, 700 years, uh, before the Christ child was actually born. That's a long time to wait, 700 years, before this sign came to be, came to pass. So the prophecy that came to Isaiah, the word of God, to Isaiah, to the people, begin to look for a sign. The virgin shall conceive. There were multiple prophecies that were given, where he would be born, what his name would be. Uh, the, his lineage would be of the line of David, and so we could follow David's line, and we can see that Joseph was from the line of David. All these as hints, puzzle pieces, so we could put together now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, where he was supposed to be, from Joseph, the lineage of David, to a virgin, Mary, this is him. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Today, as we look at the reality of the Christmas story, I want us to, to look at something that happened before the birth of Jesus, but it happened right before the birth of Jesus and plays a huge role in the preparation of the story of the birth of Jesus. And it's rarely talked about during our Christmas season. But we want to look at Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest and Elizabeth came from priestly parents. We know some about their lineage. We know a little bit about them. We know they're very blameless and good people. We know that Elizabeth was barren and that when we pick up the story here, we see that they're both advanced in years. What we're about to read is what happened right before the birth of Jesus. Let's venture in and learn about Zechariah and Elizabeth. To understand Zechariah and Elizabeth, we have to go back to the original prophecy. Remember, the prophecy said that we will send a sign. But it has been a long time. It's been 700 years since God said that to Isaiah. They've been waiting for 700 years for this oath, this, this promise that God would send the Messiah. So can you imagine waiting for 700 years? It's been passed down from generation to generation. Wait, God promised with an oath. Remember, God promised with an oath. He will send the Messiah. And so they waited year after year for God. Just like sometimes we have to wait for God to answer maybe your prayer. And you feel like you've waited for a long time for God to answer your prayer. Be patient. And trust 
that God always remembers his oath. Let me show you something really interesting before we even read this passage about Zechariah and Elizabeth. The word Zechariah, the name Zechariah means God remembers. And Elizabeth means his oath, God's oath. So if you put Zechariah and Elizabeth together, you have God remembers his oath. How beautiful that God knew exactly what he was doing and he even put a certain couple together to literally explain that he remembered the promise that he made. Let's go and see the fulfillment of this promise. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin on verse 5. Luke chapter 1, beginning on verse 5. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abihu. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Let's pause there for a moment. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, this is Herod the Great, these are dark days. These are incredibly dark days when Herod the Great was on the throne. He was a vicious man. This is one of the darkest times in human history. This is the same man. You might remember when, he, when Herod found out, this is the same Herod where the wise men, the, the magi came and ascertained of Herod where the Christ child would be born. And they said, he'll be born in Bethlehem. And then he, Herod said, look, if you find the Christ child, Come back and tell me, and I'll go and worship him too. Of course, the wise men knew that the only reason Herod said, come and tell me where he is, is so that Herod could go and destroy the Christ child. He had no intent of worshiping him. Herod was, was prideful. He wanted all the glory and all the uh, adoration for himself. Do you remember when the wise men heard from the Lord not to go back and tell Herod, and they went home another way, that Herod found out that this had happened and he had all the children that were two years old and younger destroyed. Do you remember that? That's the Herod that we're talking about. He's a cruel and wicked man. So we are in a very dark time. So sometimes we feel like when we're in our current situation and we look around and we say, gosh, it's just never been worse than it is right now. We've never gone through a time as a nation as hard as it is right now. We've never, no one's lived through a time as difficult as what we're going through right now. Sometimes we need to put some perspective to our statements and realize that these were far darker days with King Herod, Herod the Great. And others have gone through difficult times. There have been tragic times. Sometimes it's good for us to remember that God has sustained us through difficult times and he'll continue to sustain us through difficult times. We will hold on to God and he will not leave us or forsake us, even in this season that we're in right now. This is why it's good to know the reality of the first Christmas, that the reality of the first Christmas came in the shadow of a very dark time. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under. That's the Herod. Those are the dark days of weeping that Jesus was born into. This is when we find ourselves with Zacharias, the priest. Let's go to verse 6 and verse 7 of Luke chapter 1. Verse 6 reads, And they were both righteous. This is Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly into all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. 
But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. They were righteous and blameless. But before we get to that, remember Luke, who wrote this, was a doctor. And Luke doesn't just tell us uh, why they didn't have children or that they didn't have children. Luke tells us exactly why they didn't have children. Because, see, it was considered then, in this day and time, that if you did not have a child, that God was angry with you somehow and that he didn't allow you to have a child, which we know is not true at all. But that's what they believed, that somehow you were cursed or, or God was angry with you or you had done something wrong. And that's why God didn't allow you to have a child. So Dr. Luke, who wrote this for us, doesn't just say they were without children. Luke says there's two reasons why they didn't have children and two reasons why it was impossible for them to have children. Number one, Elizabeth was barren. She could not have children. It wasn't a curse from God. It was that she could not have children up to this point in time. And the second is Luke tells us they were advanced in years. They were, they were advanced beyond the childbearing age. So Dr. Luke tells us, look, there's two reasons why this is impossible for Elizabeth and Zachariah to have a child. They're, they're too old and Elizabeth is barren, unable to have children. So that gives us a piece of the story, but another piece is very clear here that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were blameless, righteous people. They walked rightly before God. They pleased God and how they lived out their life. Wouldn't you love to hear about you when you stand before God that he says, you're righteous and blameless, well done, my good and faithful servant. Psalm 15, verse 1 and 2 says, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. That's what we should be striving for, is a blameless and pure lifestyle. If you know that there are things in your life that are not pleasing to God, I strongly strongly urge you to remove those things. Let's be those who are, our aim and our goal is to be blameless and righteous before God. We will never be perfect, for we, we live in a flesh body. Our body's tendencies are to be selfish and to be ungrateful and to not serve the Lord. So that's why we have to have self Control, to control oneself, to submit oneself to the will of God, to do what God wants us to do, and not the selfish desires that we would naturally have. Did you know that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, it's actually told that this is what God desires of us, that, that we may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. God desires for you and for me to be blameless and innocent. But I love that he said, in a twisted and crooked generation. It reminds us that there's always been corruption, but it's no excuse for the children of God to follow into that destruction and corruption. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. Remember, we have, we have died to that sinful nature and we live to Christ. So we need to be pursuing purity, not allowing what we know is inaccurate. So make sure, if you can think right now of an adjustment that you need to make in your life, make it. Scripture tells us if you know the good that you ought to do and you don't do it, it's sin. So let's make today a, a day where we say, look, I know the good I ought to be doing. And I'm, I'm actually going to do it. Like Zechariah and Elizabeth. Let's go to verse 8. And nine of Luke chapter one. 
Now, while he was serving as priest at Zechariah before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Let's pause for a minute. Zechariah was a priest, and it clearly tells us here that his division was on duty. There was a whole group of priests. Do you know how many priests worked in Jerusalem at the temple at this time? 20,000 priests were employed at the temple. 20,000 priests. So when it says that his division was on duty, this is a group of priests, a section of them that were called for this particular purpose on this time. But then out of that group, they would cast lot, which one was to enter the temple and actually burn the incense. This is how they, they let God guide them. Now, we see that once the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2 and is given to us to guide us, they no longer cast lots for making decisions. They would hear from the Holy Spirit and make a decision. But before Acts chapter 2, they always were casting lots to make their decisions because they believed that God, which he did, would, would manipulate who he wanted he would put where he, who he wanted where he wanted them. And what you're about to find out is God put Zechariah in the right place on the right day at the right time. So they would cast lots. You see that throughout the Old Testament. Even when the disciples were trying to figure out which uh, to take in a new disciple when Judas had betrayed uh, Jesus and then had gone and, and killed himself. They, they, the disciples gathered together, the 11 of them, and they said, we need to choose one more disciple to bring us back up to the number of 12. And they picked three men, and then they cast lots. But then Acts chapter 2 comes along, where it says that the Holy Spirit came and began to dwell within them, and they never cast lots ever again, because now God was literally living within them, and they could hear and sense the Holy Spirit. This is why today you and I do not need to cast lots or gamble and assume that that's how God will somehow direct us. No, we can, we can sense the leading of God. We have the word of God. And we also have other Christian brothers and sisters and pastors and leaders that we trust that we can bounce things off of. We do not need to gamble and and cast into the air what God desires for us to do. One of the things I want to show you, though, is if you do the math from how many priests there are and the casting of lots for each individual section, what we found, and we found this in historical documents, that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be the priest that actually burned the incense in the holy place, in the temple. They waited their whole lives to be chosen by their lot and their division, and then they would cast lots, and every priest would hope and pray, is today the day that I, I get to go into the holy place, and I get to burn the incense before the altar of God. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Zechariah. It was a custom that they had been following. We see this in Exodus chapter 30. It tells us what they would do, that they would come in and they would burn the incense and what was in the holy place. This was a, a custom that they would follow and it regarded the idea of lighting incense. They would burn uh, their sacrifices. Actually, when you walked into the holy place, well, if we back up a little, if you were to walk into the temple, there were separate areas that were designated for different purposes. Some areas were for Jews and Gentiles. Some areas were uh, just for women. Some areas were just for Jewish men. But once you got up to the doorway of the temple, 
They called walking through this one particular room the holy place. When you walk in that room, on the left-hand side, there would have been a lamp stand. Uh, on the right-hand side, there was a, a table where they would put what they called the bread of the presence. It was 12 loaves of bread for the 12 tribes of Israel. That was on the right-hand side. And in front of you was the altar. And they would burn incense on the altar. And they would sacrifice a lamb uh, on the altar. And there, there was ceremony and ritual involved that God had ordained. And if you were the priest that was chosen, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go into that place and to to burn incense. It was such a holy place, no one else could go in. Actually, I'll give you a little detail that to clean this room, they actually put holes in the ceiling so that they could, they could put rods down and they could wash the walls from the candle soot because the walls had, had a golden tinge to them that they had painted and built it with. They, that's how they could wash the floor was these long wooden rods through these holes in the ceiling because you couldn't go in unless you were a priest. And the priests were not allowed to go in and to clean and to, to work in that area. They were going in with a specific task. And they did only what they were told to do in that place. Actually, in Exodus, it tells us that they could never offer unauthorized incense on the altar. God was very meticulous about what he wanted and what he ordained. So for Zechariah to be in that place, to go into that holy, holy space, was a chance of a lifetime. He might have waited his entire life for this moment. Now, I want to show you briefly that incense has represented prayer always. That they would burn incense like a prayer. We see scriptures that say that our, our prayer is like an evening incense. It's like an evening sacrifice. I'll show you a couple. Um, Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 says, And when they had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you know that when you pray before God, not only does he hear you, but he stores up your prayer in, a, in these golden-like bowls before his throne, and it's like incense before him. Are your prayers beautiful fragrance before God? And how full is your bowl? Do you fill that bowl to overflowing with incense before your king? This is why they would go in and they would offer incense. And the smoke rising was a symbol of this idea that it would go up and offer to God a beautiful incense of prayer. That's why they would go in and they would light incense. It was a pleasing fragrance to God, an offering to God. This is why when in a moment we'll see that God responds by saying, I've heard your prayer, Zechariah. That incense that was burned, I've, I've heard what you said. But one last thing is when when the priest would go in and he would do his priestly duties, this, this life calling, he'd waited his whole life for this moment. When they would leave that place of prayer, remember how it said earlier in this scripture that there was a whole multitude, it's verse 10 in Luke 1. There's a whole multitude of people outside and they were praying when the priest would go in and pray. The priest would go into the temple and he would burn the incense it would be a pleasing sacrifice to God. But what's interesting is the priest would come back out and he would address the crowd. And the priest would actually bless the crowd with what's called Aaron's blessing. This is found in Numbers chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. It's, this is the blessing that Zechariah should have come out and said to the people. He would have said this, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is Aaron's blessing. Aaron was a priest. And this has been passed down to all the priests. Now remember, this was Zechariah's moment. That God had, had divine providence to wait until this day and this moment to bring Zechariah, the one that even his name means God remembers. And he brings Zechariah into this holy space. And in this moment, what happens to Zechariah? Verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. An angelic visitation. Zechariah goes into the holy place. The calling of a lifetime. And when he goes before the, the altar, there stands an angel. Here's why this is maybe more crucial than we can think of in just seeing an angelic being. God has not spoken for 400 years. Remember, we started by talking about what prophets were. Prophets were these people that heard from God. God would speak to these chosen people in different regions and different places, and they would then speak. This is why you'd hear this in the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord. They heard from God, and they wouldn't say, uh, this was my opinion. They'd say, thus saith the Lord. So that you knew the prophet is speaking a word from God. Listen carefully. The prophet is speaking. But ever since Malachi, he was the last prophet. There were no more prophets. They all, God stopped talking. They had nothing to say. They said, I haven't heard anything. God stopped speaking. So it's been 700 years since Isaiah said there'll be a sign, the Messiah is coming. And they've been waiting, and then after 300 years of waiting, God stopped talking completely. Have you ever been in a season in your life where you felt like God wasn't speaking? You kept asking, but you didn't hear anything in return? Remember, God's not gone. But there might be a season where you need to really press in to hear his still, quiet voice. Sometimes we need to learn to get quiet to hear the quiet. It's been 400 years and no one has seen any angels. No one has heard from the prophets. God stopped speaking. This is the last thing that the last prophet ever said. Actually, if you go to the Old Testament, go to the last page of the Old Testament, to the very last verse of the Old Testament, you'll read this, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. These are the last things written down, and then 400 years of silence. This is what Malachi heard. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Another sign. Isaiah said, look for the sign for the virgin to give birth to Emmanuel, who is God with us. But now the last prophet has heard, I'll send you a prophet before Emmanuel comes. That's the last thing they heard, and no more prophets spoke. The last thing they heard was, there'll be a prophet that was like Elijah, And he's going to show up before the Messiah shows up. And now the angel appears to Zechariah after 400 years of silence. And the angel says this. He'll turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. And to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just... This is the one. This is the the one we've been waiting for. It's happened. Zechariah has just heard from an angel, it's time for the Messiah to be born. The prophet before the Messiah has been told he's coming. It's been 400 years of silence, and then God spoke. I want to tell you a quick story about this idea of silence for a long time. Years ago, gosh, maybe 20 years ago now, I was at a a beautiful elderly care facility, uh, and we were putting on a Christmas concert, and I was asked to come and, and to say a few words and to play the piano, and they'd gathered everyone there. There was, there was hundreds of people that had come and, and they had brought out a beautiful piano for us and we had a beautiful choir there and, and we had sung our hearts out and I had shared some scriptures from my heart and wished everyone a Merry Christmas. But before the night was over, I remember saying to all of those that were present there, we, we never know when the Lord is going to take us home. And so I knew, and some of them knew, that this might very well be their last chance to, to celebrate Christmas here. And so the Lord put on my heart to, before we end, let's, let's just sing Silent Night. No, no music, no, no big orchestra. Let's just sing and so I, I just began to sing Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is bright. And everyone began to join in. The choir that was there, of course, they began to sing. And, and all the residents that were there and all the nurses around them and all the help, they kind of came in from everywhere. And now all of us are just singing. Silent night, holy night. But I I noticed that several nurses began to move, kind of hustle a little quickly over to this one particular lady who was almost in the front. She wasn't very far from me at all. And, you know, of course, you're slightly concerned if something has happened. And So we continued to sing, but I noticed that the nurses that were gathering around, now five or six of them, around this one particular lady that was sitting right in the front, they, the nurses, were were teary-eyed and crying, but they weren't weren't taking care of this woman. Actually, the, the woman just seemed to be singing along with us, Silent Night, Holy Night. I was curious why... Why the hustle? Why did all these nurses come over to be with this particular elderly woman when she was just singing along? Nothing seemed to be wrong that I could see. At the end of Silent Night, I prayed 
the best that I could and thanked everybody and wished them all a Merry Christmas. Everyone began to be dismissed and, and taken back to their rooms. And I went over to one of the nurses who was still crying and they're talking to this elderly woman sitting right in front of me. And I said, is everything okay? And she is trying to speak to me, but she was really broken up. And she said, what you don't understand, Pastor, this woman hasn't spoken in 20 years. And when we began to sing Silent Night, she just began to sing. And now she's talking to us. God unlocked something in this beautiful woman through the gift of Silent Night. 20 years, she hasn't said a word. And here, she began to speak. Everyone that heard that story was just overwhelmed that God had worked such a beautiful miracle, such a kind, kind miracle. I've told that story to the church I was working at then and to others when the time seems fitting and every time People are blown away 20 years of not saying anything at all and to have it broken off with Silent Night. If that is so monumental, can you imagine what 400 years of not hearing the voice of our Creator and then Gabriel shows up, the angel, and speaks on behalf of God. That's how powerful this moment was for Zechariah to see the angel and to hear good news. We've heard from God again. If 20 years breaks our heart, 400 years blows our mind. We have heard from God again. Let's see how Zechariah responds to the angel speaking to him directly. Remember, we are in the holy space, that holy room set aside for incense. This is how Zechariah responds. Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Gay. Gabriel speaks to Zechariah, and Zechariah's response was to doubt that it was possible. To doubt that it was possible. And Gabriel is furious. How dare you doubt? It's been 400 years, and Gabriel says, I stand in the presence of God. I'm an angelic being. And you still doubt that this is possible? Now, you and I can look back at Zechariah and say, well, if I was in there and I saw an angel, I would have believed it. I would have bought it hook, line, and sinker. I'd have said, absolutely, I'd have hit the turf. I'd have been on my nose. You know what, though? God tells you things to this day, and we don't buy into them. We don't, we don't hook into it. When God says, I've never left you, and you say, where is God? 
When you, you feel like you can't sense God and you say that he must have been far away or you believe that God won't provide for you when he said he would or you doubt that God can heal you when he said he could. See, we're doing the same thing that Zechariah did, which is to doubt that it's even possible. How about when you need God to provide for you and you say, I mean, this one might be beyond God. I mean, I, I am so far behind. I don't even know how I'll ever catch up. Or when we say, look, even the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with me. So, I mean, I don't even know if this is something that God could handle. We do the same thing that Zechariah did. So we can't point fingers just at him when we need to realize that we have the same, if not even more so, action in our own life. Remember, Zechariah was a blameless, righteous man. He lived a good life. But in this moment, when he was visited by Gabriel, an angel of God, he doubted that it was possible. I want to show you a comparison, though. When Gabriel, the same Gabriel, went and visited Mary, he told Mary that she would give birth to a son. And Mary also questioned Gabriel. I want to show you that. Luke chapter 1, verse 34 says, Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? Did she doubt? And Zechariah doubted? Now Gabriel responds to Mary with a very kind-hearted answer and says, The Lord himself will do it. Don't you worry, it's going to be okay. This is how it's going to work. But when Zechariah doubted, he got in trouble. He, he, was, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak until the day that John was born and he had to speak and write what his name would be. That's how long, nine months, he had to wait where he could not speak at all. What's the difference here? Well, there's two things. One, Zachariah was a priest and an old man and should have known better. Mary was a young girl and was not a priest. She did not work in the temple of God. Zechariah had been waiting his whole life for this moment. Zechariah should have had the maturity to trust. If an angel shows up and tells me something impossible, I believe him. Because God had sent him and God can do the impossible. It should have been great faith on Zechariah to say, I believe it, let's see it happen. That's number one. But number two shows you that God can see the intent of our heart. Mary was not saying, I doubt that it can happen. She was saying, how are you going to do it? I'm sure you will do it. I was just curious how you're going to do it. How is, how is that going to work if I'm a virgin? A question of, I believe you can. I'm just wondering how. With Zechariah, do you notice that he said, because you did not believe my words. Zechariah didn't think it was possible. Mary never said she thought it was impossible. She was just curious how he was going to do it. This is a difference in our faith level as well. When God says that he's going to do something, our response should not be, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I just don't see how that's going to work out. It doesn't, it doesn't even seem reasonable. Or is our response a response of faith? I'm not sure how you're going to do it, but I believe that you can. I'm not sure how you're going to work this out, but I trust that you will. Faith. Faith doesn't mean you don't have questions. Faith means your question is followed with, I'm sure you will. I know you can. See the difference? Mary never doubted. She was just wondering how it will happen. But the priest, the one that's waited all his life, who lived a righteous life, did not believe that this was possible. He knew his wife was barren. He knew they were both advanced in years. What he didn't believe is that it's been 400 years since God spoke. And now that he has, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Romans chapter 4 verse 21 says to be fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. If God has promised, 
he can do it. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. Is God, your picture of God, a God that can do more than you could even think? Zechariah clearly did not see it that way. But he needed to. I want to teach us one quick lesson here before we close. How do we talk back to God? If you pray to God, do you pray with reverence and awe? Or do you just talk to God like he's your best buddy? Remember, we were told to still come with reverence and awe when we worship and honor God. In prayer, in song, even when we come to his holy word, we should read it with reverence and awe, with respect for who he is and who we are. Creator, created. How do you come before God? Do you bring the utmost of respect? How do you come to the house of God? Do you bring your utmost respect? Someone once told me that the Bible says, come as you are. I said, I agree with that. It doesn't say stay that way. You're all welcome, but don't stay as you came. Learn about who God is. And we learn to honor him, to have reverence for him. Because when we start talking back to God, when we start to talk to God flippantly, as if somehow we're going to give him counsel, as somehow he made the wrong decision and we're going to let him know what we really want. I want to show you a scripture that we rarely ever read. It's Romans chapter 9, verse 20, and it says, But... Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? One of the best things that you can do for your spiritual maturity is to recognize that he is the creator and you are the created. Stop thinking that we can counsel God or, or speak to him with flippancy. He deserves honor and respect, both in your personal relationship and in his house. Honor and respect. Scripture says, I want all things done decently and in order. But this is how it closes. We go back to Luke chapter 1 and we end with verse 24 and 25. It says, After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. John the Baptist has now been born. Jesus said, no man born of a woman is greater than John the Baptist. The greatest man to ever live was born. John the Baptist's job was to be born, like the prophet said, to prepare the way for the birth of Jesus. Zechariah and Elizabeth are part of the Christmas story just as much as the angels and the shepherd and the magi, the wise men, all of that plays a role in the reality of the first Christmas. The reality is there was a miracle, a birth to a barren woman, not a virgin, but a barren woman. And this child was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb of Elizabeth. So, when we see this part of the Christmas story, we see that there have been miracles preparing the way for the birth of the Messiah. But I want to show you something that's interesting. Remember that Zechariah means God remembers. And Elizabeth means his oath. But John means God is gracious. God made a promise, an oath, and through Zechariah, he remembered it. The oath was birthed out of Elizabeth, and the oath was to fulfill that God is gracious. 
Because remember, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world would be saved through him. Remember, Jesus was born to give his life for us. That's the actual truth of the reality of the first Christmas. And I want to give you a picture so that you can understand that the reality of the first Christmas did start with a prophecy. And then John the Baptist began to prepare everybody. Look closely. He's coming. He's here. But I was given a gift just this past week. I was here in the church with my family and we were working on some things and a a woman came in and her family, they, they are wonderful members of the church, but they can't be in the building right now because uh, both of their daughters uh, are, are just high risk. And, and so they have to stay at home and they watch these videos. Hi, girls. But this particular woman came in and she gave my family a gift. And she said we could open it right then and there, and so we did. And it was this incredibly gorgeous painting of the nativity scene. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the magi. It was beautiful, painted on a beautiful piece of wood. But what was interesting is what she wrote, what she, she painted on the top of the, of the nativity scene was something I've never seen written on a nativity before. Normally you write something like, um, unto us a child is born, some Christmas scripture. But she said that she wanted something with more boom, more bang to it. And so she wrote, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. You know, no one I, that I know of has written that over a manger scene. But it's perfect. For he was born in a manger. But did you know that John the Baptist, when he finally saw Jesus at 30 years old, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how John the Baptist, who had been preparing everybody that the Messiah would come, when he first saw Jesus at 30 years old, he said, there he is. That's the Messiah. He's the savior of the world. He's a lamb. And he's come to save us. So it's perfect that above the nativity says, Behold, the Lamb of God. It's found in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember, that was the purpose of the first Christmas. The reality of the first Christmas is that God was with us, Emmanuel. And he sent someone in front of him to prepare the way. And when that man saw him, he knew exactly who he was. It wasn't just a Jewish man named Jesus. It was the Lamb of God who came to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the reality of the first Christmas. It was the birth of the rescue plan. I encourage you to remember the reality of the first Christmas, and it'll help us get through the reality of this Christmas, that God is for us and not against us. And whether you can feel him or not, he is there. Whether you can sense him or not, he's there. And even when it feels like he's silent, he is still with you. And he will bring you through whatever season you're in. Remember how much he adores you. 
Father, we thank you that the reality of the very first Christmas helps us with the reality of this Christmas season. You have never left us. You've never forsaken us. But even when there were 400 years where you weren't speaking, the plan was already started. You put Zechariah in the temple at the right time, at the right place, and you reminded us that God remembers his oath through Zechariah and Elizabeth, who had served you faithfully all their lives. But we want to learn from this. We don't want to doubt that you can do the impossible. We trust you. So whether we see you or not, we have faith to believe that right now you're with us in our home. You're with us wherever we are. We thank you because you're an amazing God. As we close this time, Father, we, your children, with all the reverence and honor and respect that we can muster, we want to pray together to you because we know that the prayer we are about to pray will be gathered up and become like a beautiful incense that goes before you. So let us all bring our incense of prayer before God as we unite together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all until we meet again.